Welcome back to another North Carolina Tar Heels football podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. And if you were watching us on our fast growing YouTube channel, that is called Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones, and joining me is THI staff writer and resident Jack, our Noah Taylor, Mr. Brandon P. And Brandon, we're back here for part seven of our nine part series previewing Carolina's 2022 football team. The season is just around the corner. Tar Heels kick off August 27th at home versus FCS member Florida A&M. Tell you what, man, the excitement that we as journalists have as the season comes really, yeah. really grows because fall camp and practice seems like it's six months long, right? Yeah. But I'm really sensing that we're around that last little curve here. And a big part of this is the fact that we're talking about offensive skill, guys. We're getting close to the end of recording this nine-part series. And here in part seven, Brandon, we're going to discuss Carolina's wide receivers, an interesting room similar to the running back room where there's a lot of guys in there that might get on the field that haven't really played either much or at all at the college level. Before we discuss that very quickly, Brandon, I want to remind everybody, go on over to TarHeelIllustrate.com for just $8.33 a month. You can be a Tar Heels insider too, period. You want to be an insider? You want to be a stud at the water cooler? You want to be a stud at the local bar? You want to be a stud in the in the in the supermarket line as you're talking to a Car- guy wearing a Carolina hat. Go to THI, sign up for just eight thirty three a month. You have access to literally everything we do, and we do so much more than what you see in these videos. So much more than the free articles that we put out on Twitter and other social media platforms. A lot of it's premium, and you must be a subscriber to access that stuff. So it's just eight thirty three a month. You could be an insider too. So Brandon, the wide receiver room, there were eight guys. Now there's seven. There'll be an eighth again when Antoine Green comes back at some point, I would assume early October is probably the best bet for when he will return. What the Tar Heels lost there was a guy who's big time experience. So now there's only two dudes in the room that have played a lot at the college level. Josh Downs, obviously record setter last year, 101 catches, 1,335 yards. Those are both Carolina single-season records. He also had eight touchdown receptions. And Justin Olsen played 491 snaps last year, but caught just nine passes. Mm -hmm. So he's experienced running routes. He doesn't have a lot of productivity in his past. and Otherwise, there's not much else in that room as far as proven productivity. So when you think about the wide receiver room outside of Josh Downs, what do you see right now? Without Antoine Green, obviously, who won't be back for at least another six or seven weeks, at least. Well, with the loss of Antoine Green for at least the first three games, the wide receiver room is, in my opinion, is in the same situation that it was entering the last season. There's a there's one guy in the room who we're very comfortable with that will be good in Josh Downs. But after him, there's no certainty of who we know will produce on a consistent basis. However, I do think the difference between this season and last season is the current the current unproven guys, you know, the J.J. Jones, the Andre Green, the Gavin Blackwell, the Kobe Pacers. I believe those guys are more talented than the guys last year that we were expecting to step up in the wide receiver position last season. Um, before we went to the first practice, UNC allowed, uh, allowed the – media to attend you told me that some that some guys are going to pop and make plays in practice and then you and it'll give us an idea of who could possibly step up in the breakout season but when we went to practice i said gavin blackwell kobe pay sword all those guys i just named they they were making play they all had their moments where they were making big plays in the practice and they all had their moments where they looked like they can be impressive college wide receivers especially uh andre green because you know he's the youngest one but all those guys at some point in the practice stepped up and they made plays uh during the practice so we'll see who can do it on a consistent basis on saturdays in response to that and i i'll draw a comparison okay last year we we got to see some practices and uh, you know, Emory Simmons didn't pop as much and Choffrey Brown didn't pop as much. And he was still dropping balls and stuff like that. And they had been around and they were both very talented guys, especially Choffrey. He was a four-star guy coming out of high school. Uh, Emory was somebody who committed a lot of places and had both of them had done something. And Emory had shown a little bit. 
but they didn't pop that much. And what's interesting is the three guys you just mentioned, the, the three second-year players, Pesor, Blackwell, and JJJ. We have DJJ in the backfield and JJJ at wide receiver. Uh, you know, they were there last year and didn't really do much. Pesor played three snaps. Blackwell played three snaps. JJJ played 62 snaps. Started getting on the field a little bit. I remember looking down from the press box at Notre Dame saying, hey, J.J. Jones is on the field. Okay, yeah. that's pretty cool. He's getting some needed reps. And so there goes the red shirt. Um, <laughs> but they haven't done much really at all with respect to production, but they popped in practice. They yeah. look, each of them looked like they took monumental steps forward in their game. I agree. We saw some stuff in the spring, but man, those first couple of practices and when we, and the fact that they gave us Kobe, in interviews and they gave us JJ in interviews. And um, I guess maybe Gavin hadn't been, we ha we're not done yet with interviews. Maybe we get Gavin at some point uh, by the time this runs, we may have already gotten Gavin, but I the think... fact that they, when they, when they give us kids in the interviews, it's, they do it because they're playing well. They're not going to give us a kid that's just not playing well. So that's an indication of how they feel about, okay, this guy's a chance to get on the field. We're going to let you talk to him. They're not going to let us talk to a kid who's not going to get on the field at all. There's no point in that. It's not fair to the player, and they're not going to, you know, it, it would sort of like be screwing with the media a little bit, right? But yeah, we're getting yeah. these kids. So all three of them popped. They're all kind of different in some ways. I love JJJ being the guy going down the, down the corner. He gives them an, a quarter end zone component that Andre Green also gives them now that they lacked last year. So uh, I think the three of them, one of the three of them, by November is going to have, you know, 25, 30, 35 receptions. I would think they're going to be that kind of player, maybe more, maybe a real breakout from one of those guys. But I do think all three of them, a will get on the field early and get a chance to get more reps. B um, will, will have an opportunity to be a significant part of the production at wide receiver, because until other guys step up, defenses are going to lock down on Josh. Josh didn't score touchdowns the second half of last year. Team, his big plays were cut down. So they need these other guys to step up and do what their talent suggests they can do. Yeah. Uh, J.J. Jones is a – he kind of – when I watch him, he reminds me a lot of Antoine Green, maybe a little bit bigger, like a little bit bigger version of Antoine Green with his size – speed he has really strong hands um i'm actually interested in getting your because we've been hearing a lot of, we've been seeing we've seen andre green in person and there's a lot of hype around him surrounding the program what exactly did you see from him when you were when we were at the practice like what what exactly made him pop out when we were at the practice yeah real quickly on jjj a little more athletic a little more bounced than antoine especially after antoine's injury yeah. and he's a little got a little bit more length a little We'll call it, we call it, we use the term wiry a lot in basketball, but we can use that with JJ. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I, th I think there's an element to that, his game. I think he might be the guy that can make the really difficult catch a little bit more than Antoine. The contested catch his career. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as far as Andre Green goes, what would you say? What popped out about him? Yeah. yeah. What, what, what popped out, out, out about him when you saw him in practice in person? It just, uh, he just, whoa, that's him. I mean, I didn't have to look for him. Yeah. yeah and what's I, interesting. <laughs> What's interesting is Mac made a point when we talked to him here recently about when NFL scouts come to camp, he tells the players, don't expect us to tell them where you are. They should find you. You should stand out. And so when NFL, I mean, there's been NFL scouts at a lot of the practices, we're going in the gate, go talk to the kids. Often there's NFL scouts walking out. Yeah. The practice has yeah. ended. So when an NFL scout goes in there and they say, hey, I'm going to check out the wide receivers. They don't have to turn to Jeremy or Mark and say, hey, which one's Andrew, Andre Green? They don't need a roster to find a guy. Now, they'll have a roster to confirm who it is. But they look and they see Andre Green. They ah, that must be him. Yeah. We've heard a lot about that guy. So to be more specific, he he looks the part. He doesn't look like he just showed up. He, he looks like he's been there a while. He runs – beautiful routes, you know, just the way he runs them. Now he may not always run them right. I don't know. Cause I don't know the routes and that's certainly not my forte, but everything he does looks like he's doing it right. Like he's a guy that he could run the wrong route and really screw up a whole play, but he'll look pretty doing it <laughs> because he's just a breathtaking athlete. He's unique. He's a different dude than they've had in that room before. And he's a different dude 
from an athletic standpoint, from a gliding standpoint, from a smoothness standpoint, from the standpoint that he can run all the different routes. You can do a whole lot of different things with him. So you're going to have multiple sets of eyes in the secondary always on him, especially once he gets seasoned, a little bit more seasoned, right? Yeah. But he's a guy that can find the end zone. He's a guy that can move the chains. He can, He's a guy that you can run a multitude of things to, and I think he'll be able to handle it pretty quickly in his career. He's big enough that I think he can handle some of the hits. He's fast enough. He's quick enough. He can get open inside. He's fast enough. He can get open outside. He's got hands. He's got notice for the end zone. He's a competitor. He's got everything you want. He's one of those it guys. Yeah, they, they I, have a few. They have a few it talents on this team, especially with the really young dudes. And I would probably put him at the top of that list right now, especially given his role, the opportunity in that room, and his, where his talent level is, and, and how it's a little easier maybe get on the field as a true freshman as a receiver than some other positions. Yeah, I agree. Uh, when we were at the practice, I saw him and he was matched up with Tony Grimes a lot. I remember one specific play. It was a run play. It was a going. It was a run play on the opposite on the opposite uh, side of the field. And Andre Green didn't come off and block really hard. He was just kind of going through the motions because he knew it was on the opposite side of the field. Tony Grimes probably going to make the play. But when the ball was snapped, I guess Tony Grimes saw the the play going to the opposite side, and he just ran up to Antoine Green and just hit him right in the chest as hard as he could. And and like just the way that he took that hit, I was very impressed with his uh, physicality. And when, even at the top of his route, how physical he was with Tony uh, coming off the top of his route, trying to create space is just really impressive. And if he can compete with a guy like Tony Grimes, there's going to be very few guys out there that can, you know, really cover him. You made a really good point in the running back podcast about watching British Brooks before the injury uh, teaching Omarion Hampton and George Petaway, some stuff, some footwork and fundamentals things, some of the real basic things. A lot of kids don't have to be really good at in high school when they're so talented because they just get the ball and run that they need to be good at in college. The point you just made about Tony Grimes, I also take that as Tony saying, come on, dude, you got to go 100% every snap. Yeah, You can't yeah. sell what's going to happen by going at it 85%. You yeah. know, when we talk to uh, Noah Taylor, the Jack, the kid from Virginia, about about rushing the passer and some of the uh, intangibles that you need. One of them he said is reading the blockers, reading the tight end. Where you know when does the tight end look at you? Does he always look at you every snap, or does he only look at you for a glance if he knows he must worry about where you are that play? Mm. You know, the toes, the nose. Uh, are they leaning back a little bit? Are they lean, lunging forward a little bit in their three point stance? That was Tony's way of saying you can't give stuff away. Yeah. And yeah. we've seen that. And this is obviously a broader what we've seen in camp thing, what we've learned. I think that that's not that that didn't happen last year, but we see it and hear about it happening more now where there's the accountability. That's Tony making Andre accountable. Yeah. Yeah. And and having that happen early in camp is exactly what Andre needs. He needs that moment because it can't happen again. So learn it on July 30th. And you don't have to worry about it being an issue on September 3rd. Yep, I agree. Uh, another guy we the a guy that really popped out to me during our time at practice is Gavin Blackwell. There was a stretch during practice where he had maybe four or five catches consecutively. Because you know how Mac, at practice, Mac Brown pretty much acts as the PA announcer and lets you know what's going on at, after each play. I heard Gavin Blackwell's name at least four times in a row one time. And it's like – the 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 jump that he's I, th I believe that wide receivers are a lot like uh, basketball players in the sense that you know a basketball player they come in as a freshman and they might not contribute at first but then they always have that sophomore jump and they're much better than they were as sophomores than they were freshmen. I believe wide receivers are similar like are very similar to that and I think the three guys that came in last year and were true freshmen they're going to make that sophomore jump this year and we should see. A much more we should see much more production out of those three including gavin blackwell yeah. got us sure hands can i think jj jones is the big body on the outside that can get you the the contested catches andre green is the hybrid guy that can do like a little like do a little bit of everything and i think gavin blackwell he what, he, what i saw from that practice he's really good at getting the stuff across the middle the slants and stuff so i'm, I'm really interested to see how those three gel together to kind of step up in antoine green's absence yeah, a couple of things about him. Uh, we hear that he doesn't mind the physicality. He could take a pop. 
So mm-hmm. if you're going to go over the middle, you better be able to take a pop, right? The other yeah. thing, too, if you are a diehard Carolina football fan and you watch all of the interviews that we do after practice with the kids, and the kids all refer to him as Gavo. So anytime you hear Gavo, you're talking about, they're talking about Gavin Blackwell. And we've heard Gavo come up a ton mm-hmm. during fall camp, especially this first week at Well, because we had more access the first 10, 12 days of camp than we have had since then for obvious reasons. But his name came up a lot. Let me ask you about Justin Olson. 491 snaps last year, nine receptions, 143 yards, one TD. He was involved in quite a few really contested balls down the sideline, usually the left sideline. Had one taken away from him for an interception, I think, against UVA. But then he returned that against somebody else down. down. I can't remember. What, maybe it was Wake Forest where he was actually muscled the ball away. You know, he's a guy that no one's really talking about. We don't really hear his name come up, but he's experienced – and he can block, and that's one of the things that people forget about at wide receiver. you got to be able to block downfield, especially if you have game-breaking backs. Michael and Javante a couple of years ago would be the first ones to tell you that one of the reasons they were able to race for long runs into the end zone was because the wide receivers did such a good job blocking downfield. When you think about Justin Olsen and where he fits into all this, what pops to your mind first? Well, Justin Olsen went to North Nick High School, which is literally 10 minutes up the road from my house. So I, I, when I was in, when he was in high school, I got a chance to see him play a few times and he was a very good contested catch passer in high school. That exactly hasn't translated to the college level, but like you said, Justin Olsen, he's a good blocker. He does all the small things correctly, which last season was enough for him to get on the field. I'm interested to see with the more talent that they have in that room this year, will the intangibles be good enough to the intangibles alone be good enough to get him on the field or would the lack of production get somebody else out there? It's interesting to see. I think last year they didn't really have much of a choice. Uh, there wasn't m- many options behind Justin Olsen this year. I think there are more options. So I do think he's a, he's a very good player, very good blocker, but I do think he has to produce, like you said, he had 461 snaps last season and only nine catches. So I, I do believe the production has to, has to he has to have an uptick in production in order to keep his spot in the rotation because there's a lot of talent because you know the, the the more recruiting classes that come in the more talent that comes in it's going to be harder and harder for somebody to get on the field solely based on intangibles and doing the small yeah. things correctly yeah no doubt talking. well plus Choffrey left and then Emory left and that opened yeah. up opportunities for him as well I, I do think though that if if Andre Green is what a lot of us think he can be. And he may not be that guy August 27th, but is he that guy October 29th when Pitt comes to town? You know, does his development development path take him to that? And if one of the three of these second-year kids we're talking about really jumps out and they get production from all three, and Josh is still Josh, then maybe Justin Olsen might be more productive in his reps. Yeah, so okay. 490, 491 yeah. snaps and nine receptions, but that was... You stop Josh, and then what else is there to deal with? So I don't know. I, I I think that there was a lot wrong with the passing game last year, which is one of the reasons why Sam wasn't as prolific as he had been previous two years. And it wasn't just the offensive line. There were a lot of things that went into it. Just it never really felt right last year. So it much never, of what Josh did. did. No, nah, so much of what Josh did was get Josh the ball, and then Josh made it happen himself. Yeah. So his yards after catch numbers were off the charts last year. In order for this offense to work properly, you need to have a lot of yards before the catch. And you need to be able to hit the short out stuff, the medium stuff over the middle, the medium slants, the, 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 the all kinds of different routes in different dimensions and distances and spots on the field. You want to you if you were to, to go get in a drone above the field and, and drop, you know, hot marks on the field where Carolina's uh, completed passes after a game, you want that to be all over the place. You want to be a lot of marks all over the field, not just a bunch of here and then a trail of some guy running. You need to be able to run that thing all over. And I think that if they do that, Justin has a chance of being a little bit more productive. But but I do I do like the fact that if you're – if a guy that you're not really talking about in that room, as young as the room is, is a guy that played 491 snaps last year. Yeah, yeah, touche. That that actually bodes well for the room. I think the room is in pretty good shape. There's not a lot of 
uh, traction yet under these guys as far as production goes. But I think by the time we get into mid-October, I don't think anybody's going to be worried about the wide receiver room. And Antoine Green will be coming back at that point, too. And honestly, a guy like Bryson Nesbitt, he might turn out to be the best receiver on the roster by the <laughs> 10 season's ends. We haven't even mentioned him. Uh, Josh is really good, straight. man. And Andre's incredibly talented. That's the thing. Yeah, like Josh yeah. is Josh is really really good. Andre Green's incredible. Yeah, talented. I shouldn't have said NFL the best. guy. I have said the Bryson Nesbitt is a potential NFL guy. He's got that kind of talent. And and he, and look, when we talked about linebacker, we we discussed the Jacks some because of their linebacker element, right? When yeah. we talked about the defensive line, we talked about the Jacks because of their defensive line element. Okay, well, let's talk about Bryson Nesbitt with wide receivers since you brought him up. He's yeah, lined up not just at slot; he's lined up at all the different receiver positions. And not just in the spring, but also he's continued doing that in fall camp. Put your shiniest, best toys on the field. And he's one of them. So you can run Morales and Copenhaver, and you can also put Nesbitt out there. Let's say the three second-year guys aren't quite ready. But Nesbitt, who only played 89 snaps last year but caught seven passes, he was productive. He had a touchdown. And he just has that it factor thing about him, too. Maybe he's out there as well. Maybe we see him run a lot of stuff strictly as a receiver on the field. And that's a lot of that personnel grouping stuff I talked about with running back. When you have tight ends that can, that can run wide and you have someone especially like Nesbitt that can, man, they could score around with teams in pre-snap more this year than they did last year because of where guys – because these are highly talented kids, even though they're, they're not very experienced and don't have a lot of production under their belts – the options of how they can be used, I think, are greater because they have greater skill sets. Yeah. It, when when we when we ask the coaches about certain players in the offseason, you can tell how confident they are in that player's ability to perform by the conviction within their voice. <laughs> like when when we were talking about asking about Josh Downs last offseason, we knew Josh Downs was good because we saw him against Texas AM, but the con- the conviction in Mac Brown's voice of like Josh Downs is the best receiver we have. Like, like just going into the season, I knew Josh Downs would be good. I kind of get that same feeling with Bryson Nesbitt. There's a conviction when people talk about him about how good he is. So I do believe he will he will have another sophomore leap like the other three guys. I uh, yeah, I think he I think the potential for first team All ACC is there with him. I think he's that kind of talent. And and the the avenue of also serving as a wide receiver is part of that process. Yeah, a lot more target. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Part seven is in the books. He's Brandon. I'm AJ. Make sure you come on back and check out part eight, which is next, talking about QBs. And the other videos in this series, of course, are on our YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe to our channel. You hit notification bell so you're always updated when we uh, post videos and we do it often. Share the video. And if you're not a subscriber to Tar Heel Illustrated, guys, it's just $8.33 a month. $8.33 a month, and you can rock with big time Tar Heel uh, Intel, you can be an expert. You can be an insider too for just eight thirty three a month. So make sure you go on over to Tar Heel Illustrated and sign up. He's Brandon. I'm AJ. Thanks for stopping by.